March 7, 1926, the Sunday Morning Star, Wilmington, Delaware. The amazing row over the new tea hound Messiah, and why Parisians who knew the handsome Hindu deity when he played tennis refused to take him seriously. The efforts of Annie Besant to persuade a million and more theosophists from America and every other country of the world to accept her handsome young Hindu Krishnamurti as a second messiah have struck a terrible snag. At the very moment when she had assembled 2,000 delegates of all nations, including 36 from America, in the beautiful sacred grove at Adyar, India, beneath the banyan tree to proclaim her protege as a god, there came a cynical cablegram from Paris which read, Your Krishnamurti may be a god, but if he is, we suggest that you name him the Messiah of the Tennis Racket or the Tea Hound Messiah. We know him well. A few years ago, he was popular in fashionable society at Cannes, Deauville, and Varangeville. He spent all his time playing tennis and going to afternoon tea dances. This cablegram was not read to the faithful. The ceremonies beneath the banyan tree went on just the same. Krishnamurti was proclaimed the true Messiah. Thousands bowed down to worship him, and five of his twelve apostles were appointed, including Mrs. Besant herself, Bishop Charles W. Ledbetter of the Liberal Catholic Church, a Buddhist by the name of Jinhara Dasi, George Arundale and his English wife, but the interesting cablegram from Paris, or various news versions of it, were widely published in all languages. A cablegram to a New York paper said, Krishnamurti, whom Annie Besant at Madras proclaimed as the Christ in the name of the Theosophical Society, may be all that is asserted of him, but in France, he is jocularly spoken of as the Messiah of the Tennis Racket, also as a tea hound. He got his names because he is known here as a tennis player and also as one addicted to the innocuous practice which England gave to the world. Krishnamurti spent the summer of 1910 at Varangeville near Dieppe, and those who remember him and his magnificent suite are surprised to find him in his new role. He was known then as Alcyon, as his full name was too difficult even for French tongues to get around. What with his ascetic face and long flowing locks, he was the rage that summer along the entire northern coast of France. As a youth, he was extremely elegant and well-bred, and although good ladies who wished to pamper him talked much about his hours of meditation, the fact is, he spent his time playing tennis, and it is hard to distinguish him from the casual Oxford youth at the afternoon teas. This alone might not have created a furor or interfered with the propagation of the new religion. There was no accusation or even insinuation against the moral character or honesty of young Krishnamurti. The French merely pointed out with typical Gaelic skepticism that it was a little incongruous for a fashionable and worldly youth, formerly absorbed in society and sports, to reappear suddenly as a god. But it came on top of a tempest that was already raging and simply added fuel to the fire. Even prior to the news from Paris, leading theosophists not only in America but in England and on the continent had begun to withdraw from official connection with Mrs. Besant and her group at Adyar. One of the principles of theosophy is that it should be non-sectarian and, in connection with the proclaiming of Krishnamurti as the Messiah, many theosophists felt that Mrs. Besant had also accepted the Christian creed of the sectarian liberal Catholic Church. The entire London Lodge of the Theosophical Society was one of the first to withdraw, and its president, Lieutenant Colonel, C.L. Peacock issued a statement saying, Mrs. Besson's new religion is entirely contrary to the original ideas of the Theosophical Society in maintaining strict neutrality as regards particular religions. The disgraceful use being made of the society by its present president, Mrs. Besson, for the booming and advertising of her own private beliefs and superstitions is most regrettable and has been driving out of the society most of those who are genuine students and searchers for real philosophy. A number of theosophical leaders in California and New York have similarly protested against Mrs. Besant's course. The Czechoslovakian society, which embraces most of the theosophists of Central Europe, has also withdrawn from Mrs. Besant's group and has issued a statement, copies of which have already been received by the New York Society. It reads, 
Owing to the recent proclamation relating to the next incarnation of Christ into the body of Krishnamurti, the nomination of apostles, etc., the members of this section severed all connection with Adyar. The chief representatives of the Order of the Star in the East, the Esoteric Section, and the Liberal Catholic Church claim that they are now the agents of the supreme beings of the universe, and these claims are, in our opinion, pretentious and blasphemous. No one can deny the fact that the whole body of the Theosophical Society is, at present, so deeply affected and permeated by all these unproved ideas of the leaders that the society itself cannot virtually be disassociated from all this influence and cannot fail to be identified with it. It is for these reasons that we are withdrawing. Another repudiation of Mrs. Besant's new messiah comes from Bobsy Dastor Pavri, daughter of a high priest of the Parsis who studied in the United States. And so, it begins to appear that the proclamation of the Tihound Messiah under the banyan tree in India is going to end in a worldwide split up and reorganization of the Theosophical Society, one of the largest, most powerful, and most sincere of all the esoteric religions. Of course, Mrs. Besant and Krishnamurti have many defenders and inherents. One of them is Lady Emily Lutchins, daughter of the first Earl of Lytton, who knows Krishnamurti intimately. In all the years I have known him, she declares, never for one second have I faltered in my belief in the great destiny which is his. Now, the first great thing on which he is insisting over and over again is that we should realize that as servants of the Master, we must become a spiritual aristocracy of the world. Sometimes we may wonder why it is that he dresses so carefully and fashionably when he wears European clothes, and that he speaks so often of the necessity of being well-dressed. People are inclined to think that he lays too much insistence on that point, which is only the outer man, but it is because he wishes us to realize that everything in our lives is consecrated to the Master and that, therefore, we must be as beautifully equipped in every detail, even of our outer dress, as we are striving to be spiritually equipped. In the very last letter I received from him, he gave me this message, grow more and more magnificent. In talking recently, he used a beautiful simile. In the dawn, all values become alike, all levels become alike. Be careful that when the great dawn comes, you do not miss it because you are thinking so much of your own stature and advancement. While Mrs. Besant is having her worldwide troubles, Krishnamurti is having troubles of his own among his fellow native followers in India. One of his wishes is to cause all his disciples, of whatever religion, to make the sign of the cross in an endeavor to unite the religions of the East and West. The Brahmins, while following Krishnamurti's teachings and accepting him as a new incarnation of deity, or at least a partial reincarnation, refuse absolutely to do this. They don't like the sign of the cross and they don't like Christianity. They insist on making their own Brahmin signs and, at the ceremony of proclamation at Adyar, while the disciples of Mrs. Besant made the sign of the cross and did obeisance to the new Messiah in a more or less Christian ritual, the Brahmins, apart, insisted on recognizing him with the old Brahmin signs. Muslims also, some of whom believe that a part of the divine fire is in Krishnamurti, refuse to see him as a second Messiah, but prefer to look upon him as a sort of second Mohammed so they brought along their prayer carpets and knelt and prayed in the old Islamic way. Mrs. Besson's hope was to combine all religions into a new, worldwide religion centered around Krishnamurti. She is sincere in believing that Krishnamurti is an incarnation of godliness or holiness, but unbiased experts in religious psychology believe she has made a fatal mistake in her terminology in calling him the new messiah and in incorporating other Christian formulas and doctrines. Consequently, Brahmins, Buddhists, and Muslims see her efforts not as a movement toward a new worldwide religion, but as an effort to convert them to a sort of esoteric Christianity.